Okay, we're moving into the section on treatments and interventions. In regard to individual therapy, there are interventions based on different theories. So behaviorism, cognitive behaviorism, then there's classical psychoanalysis as well as the evolutions of psychoanalysis, which include ego psychology, object relations, self psychology, among others. Um, there are humanistic and existentialist psychologies, and there are also alternative approaches such as hypnotherapy and biofeedback to know about. In terms of group therapy, you want to know about Yalom and the different stages of groups and different principles, the 10 different principles that can... Next there's family therapy. So again, you have family therapies that draw from these different models such as psychodynamic and object relations, but they also have evolved their own their own orientation in terms of the structure systems of family that weave in different models. Other topics to cover um, is understanding some basics about crisis intervention, community interventions, as well as general issues that are going to come up in therapy like abuse, rape, divorce, and psychotherapy outcome research and monitoring treatment. So this will be important to know some of the statistics about how much of success in therapy is attributable to different characteristics and also for community interventions you want to know about client-centered con uh, consultation as well as administrative consultation. There are three main areas of behavioral therapies um, those based on classical condition conditioning your um, US, UR, CSCR model. There's operant conditioning and there's social learning theory. Treatments based on classical conditioning include reciprocal inhibition, systematic desensitization, dismantling strategy, in vivo aversion therapy and covert sensitization, in vivo exposure with response prevention flooding, and finally EMDR. These five different approaches fall into interventions based on classical conditioning called counter conditioning, aversive counter conditioning, and then starting with counter conditioning. Behavioral techniques that utilize this Eliminate a maladaptive behavior by pairing a condition stimulus associated with that behavior with a stimulus that naturally elicits an incompatible behavior so that the maladaptive response is replaced by, uh, by incompatible behavior. This underlies Wolpe's technique of reciprocal inhibition. He believed this approach could be used to weaken and eliminate anxiety reactions. He said, if a response antagonistic to anxiety can be made to occur in the presence of anxiety-provoking stimuli so that it is accompanied by a complete and partial suppression of anxiety responses, the bond between these stimuli and the anxiety response will be weakened. He identified a number of incompatible responses that could be used to eliminate anxiety, including relaxation, assertiveness, and sexual arousal. Systematic desensitization is the first intervention we'll talk about that's based upon Wolpe's counter conditioning. This was an application of reciprocal inhibition for eliminating anxiety responses. So what they do is they hierarchically arrange anxiety evoking events and pair it with relaxation. So as you can see, there's three different sizes of spiders and um, ostensibly this man has worked his way up to being able to stand near that biggest spider. Little does he know there's a much bigger spider behind him. So he may or may not be prepared for that. There are four stages to this process. The first is relaxation training. So the therapist needs to teach the client 
to use a technique that will produce relaxation. So this could be progressive relaxation, for example. And when you pro this with this technique, you systematically tense and relax all of the body's major muscle groups. It often begins with a standard cue, like take a deep breath, or you say, I'm relaxed. Alternatively, clients may imagine a relaxing scene, such as lying on the beach on a warm, sunny day. After relaxation training is the construction of an anxiety hierarchy. So the client and therapist are going to work together to think of events related to this target behavior, so maybe being able to hold a spider, that are ordered on the basis of the amount of anxiety they evoke. So to ensure that this hierarchy um, represents the full range of anxiety levels and that they're also equidistant in terms of amount they will elicit. So part of why this cartoon is you know, funny, if you think it's funny, is because you can see the spiders have been very carefully titrated in terms of how much they go up in terms of size, they're still in containers, and that's a pretty big leap to get from that the biggest spider in the container to the little spider coming in through the door. How do you measure that? Well, there's a scale called the Subjective Units of Distress Scale, SEDS, and this involves having the client rate each event on a scale from zero, which is complete relaxation, to 100, which is the highest level of anxiety the client can imagine. And then the events are selected on the basis of the client's rating so that the hierarchy contains about 10 to 15 items. Third, desensitization and imagination. Relaxation is then paired with a presentation of items in the hierarchy, beginning, of course, with the least anxiety-evoking item. The therapist then instructs the client to relax using whatever technique they learn during the first stage of treatment. Once the client has achieved the state of relaxation, the therapist instructs him or her to imagine the appropriate anxiety hierarchy item. The client signals the therapist whenever he or she feels anxious, and the therapist will help the client reestablish the relaxation. <coughs> Excuse me. When the client's able to imagine an item without experiencing anxiety, then you move on in the hierarchy. So this is repeated until the client can imagine the most anxiety-arousing item without experiencing anxiety, such as that big spider coming through the door. So that's an imagination. The fourth stage is when you have been desensitized, or the client's been desensitized, to about 75 to 85% of their anxiety hierarchy items. Then they begin to confront the situations in vivo, as in in life, if that's actually feasible. So in vivo is highly structured and involves facing in real life only the situations that correspond to hierarchy items that have been successfully desensitized in imagination. So you're not going to throw them into something that they haven't learned to cope with, at least in their mind. So there's something called the dismantling strategy to keep in mind here. And several investigators have used this to identify what, what's responsible for why this works, for why this can benefit clients. And when they have used the dismantling strategy, they compare the effects of various components of treatment by administering different components to different groups. The results showed that training an incompatible response and gradual exposure to anxiety-evoking events are not the essential components of systematic desensitization, even if they might have some facilitating effect. However, it's the extinction, the repeated exposure to the conditioned stimulus without the presence of the unconditioned stimulus, that's the primary factor responsible for its effects. And Bandura actually happens to be one of the researchers who did that work, along with someone named Lang, 1969. Okay, counterconditioning is also used with what? sex. It has been useful specifically with sexual disorders that, are, that have to do with performance anxiety. So Masters and Johnson in 1970 created something called Sensate Focus. Um, and what you do is you pair situations that will evoke performance anxiety with pleasurable physical sensations and relaxation. So if it's two people that, you know, have become just terrified of even hugging and kissing, then you will somehow take away what makes them anxious about that so they can start to just enjoy that. So when practitioners use this technique, they typically tell the partners, I don't want no genital sex, 
and instead they're given homework where they take turns giving and receiving pleasures through touch. So initial assignments will mean things like massages, and you move slowly to situations that include non-demand genital touching. The research has found that sex therapy is most effective for treating premature ejaculation and vaginismus. For the former, the squeeze technique is a key component of treatment, and for the latter, a combination of relaxation and progressive dilators is actually the optimal treatment. Assertive, assertiveness training is the third main area of treatment based on counterconditioning. With assertiveness training, the idea is that when you are assertive, this is incompatible with, the, with social anxiety. Um, and whereas someone might have previously fallen into, okay, I'm anxious at this party, I'm going to be passive and withdraw, or I'm anxious in this conflict with a teacher, so I'm just going to scream at them. You inhibit those behaviors by doing something that actually feels good, which is to be assertive. So you develop those assertiveness skills and find you have more choice, and you are counter-conditioned against anxiety because being assertive does not um, is reciprocally inhibited to anxiety. Aversive conditioning, or you can also think of it as aversive counter-conditioning, is when the maladaptive behavior or stimulus, the conditioned stimulus, is paired with an unconditioned stimulus that naturally evokes pain or other unpleasant responses. So instead of just removing removing the whatever it was that was um, negative and adding something positive, you're actually taking something that has been conditioned to cause positive feelings and pairing with something negative. So it's sort of the flip. And like with the other counter-conditioning techniques, if you remember systematic desensitization, you can do this both in imagination and um, in vivo, in life. So when you're doing it in vivo, this is called overt sensitization. And when you're doing it in your imagination, not in life, it's called covert sensitization. So let's talk, well, so why is this used? These are typically used for behaviors that are deviant, um, paraphilias, for example, smoking, alcohol abuse. It's not going to be used with something like social anxiety, typically. In vivo is used to treat primarily drug and alcohol addiction. So paraphilias and self-injurious -injur behaviors. So antabuse is an example of something that would be used to treat alcoholism because when you then drink, you now have extremely unpleasant sensation and feel very sick. Eliminating a sexual fetish, whatever the object is, let's say it's a shoe, might be paired with an electric shock so that eventually people are going to avoid, I don't know, sexualizing a shoe because it produces an unpleasant sensation rather than arousal. This has been found to be moderately effective initially for some patients and some problems like cigarette smoking. Problem is it's associated with high relapse rates and limited generalizability. So it's most successful when the aversive stimulus and its consequence is similar to the target behavior. Like nausea-inducing drugs are more effective than electric shock for treating alcoholism, and stale cigarette smoke and rapid smoking are more useful for reducing smoking than, you know, again, an electric shock. shock. It's also more effective when it's supplemented by booster sessions or is administered in conjunction with other treatments. And I think particularly it's worth thinking about this in terms of paraphilias treated by combining aversion therapy with orgasmic reconditioning, relapse prevention, and other techniques that help strengthen more appropriate responses. Because this is a pretty serious problem, and whereas this might be a technique that's helpful, it's not, it's not enough, and it needs to, since aversive conditioning is sometimes thought 
to actually be suppressing some learning, not really getting rid of it, then you need to make sure that you continue over time to give this treatment if necessary. Covert sensitization and imagination. You want to eliminate the behavior by imagining yourself smoking. So instead of um, actually rapidly smoking a cigarette, you imagine yourself smoking a cigarette, and then you imagine yourself becoming nauseated, throwing up on yourself, being embarrassed, all sorts of negative things. And to help establish an alternate behavior, the therapist might also have the client envision a relief scene in which, ah, they choose not to have that cigarette on a break. They're sitting on a bench and they're just breathing the fresh air and enjoying themselves. So pleasant sensations are now associated to supplement it. Finally, in terms of classical conditioning interventions, we have interventions that are based on classical extinction. The two-factor theory of learning proposes, this is Maurer, <laughs> M-O-W-R-E-R, 1960, proposes that the development of a phobic response is the result of both classical and operant conditioning. A person develops an anxiety reaction to a neutral stimulus when it's paired with an unconditioned stimulus that naturally elicits anxiety, so, or whatever aversive response, so that's the classical conditioning part. And then the operant conditioning part is the person then avoids that conditioned stimulus, the, like Albert's white rabbit, let's say, that the operant conditioning would kick in for little Albert when throughout his life he then never touches white animals, he avoids them. Because when he avo avoids those white animals, doesn't go to the zoo, leaves people's houses with white rabbits, he's, ena he's enabled to avoid anxiety, which is now operant conditioning, negative reinforcement. He, when he leaves, ah, that stress went away, leaving is reinforced, so people learn to avoid and escape. So the techniques, there are a number of techniques that are used to um, produce classical extinction, and they all involve repeated, repeatedly exposing the client to the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. So you're getting rid of, extinction always means you're getting rid of that pairing that caused some trouble from the past. Key to this, though, is also that element of operant conditioning, where people have learned, because it's negatively reinforced, to leave situations, to not take elevators, to walk up the stairs, even if it's many, many flights, so they don't have to deal with the conditioned response, which really just continues to amplify it. It gets worse. So three different, three different um approaches to classical extinction, and based on what we've already talked about with counter-conditioning and aversive conditioning, there is, again, doing it in real life and doing it in imagination. So if you do it in real life, pairing it with the operant conditioning piece is called response prevention. So in vivo exposure with response prevention. That's a key term to remember. The client's exposed to that stimulus for a prolonged period of time. So instead of systematic desensitization, you are putting that person in an elevator and they are not leaving. For example, also it can also be used with OCD. And you expose the client to obsessional cues like dirt. And you don't let them engage in their usual rituals. So they might have to sit with their hands in a bucket of dirt and they don't get to go wash their hands under scalding hot water. So they're also not escaping. There are several variations of this. So flooding, key term, is when you're just exposed to the most anxiety or fear arousing stimulus for a prolonged period of time. So that would, for example, be putting your hands in dirt for some folks with OCD. Graduated graded exposure is similar to systematic desensitization. It begins with exposure to situations that produce minimal anxiety, and then you progress to those that evoke more. That's helpful for reducing the fear and avoidance that can be caused by initial exposure to high anxiety arousing situations. So if a client's not ready to put their hands in a bucket of dirt, and maybe you even have them try it, it doesn't work, and they're never going to do it again, then you want to start with things that are a little bit less intense. But this is different than systematic desensitization and that they are still flooded with it. They still have to sit with 45 minutes to really address that, that issue. 
So what have studies found about in vivo with response prevention? Um, the exposure and the response prevention are both essential. You can't have one without the other. And prolonged exposure to the anxiety arousing stimulus is usually more effective than several brief exposures. And actually, short duration might actually increase sensitivity to fear of stimulus because then you just traumatize them without them really getting to learn, okay, that unconditioned stimulus is not here anymore. The one that caused, caused fear. Um, high anxiety prov provocation during exposure isn't may not be necessary for it to be successful. So some investigators found that the simultaneous use of a tranquilizer, which lowers anxiety, can actually enhance it. So you're really speeding up their association. Like, look, it's not, this is not necessary to feel this anxious during it. You don't need to get them anxious or then normal and then calm them down. You want them to really know, I can sit on a plane and be calm. In some situations, self-directed exposure following training by a therapist is just as effective as therapist-directed exposure. So you can prep them to go do their elevator training session, riding it up and down all day, and they don't necessarily need the therapist there. It can be just as effective for them to do it on their own. And as a clinician, you would determine, based on lots of factors, if that was the case for your client. Group exposure can also be as effective as individual treatment. And partner-assisted exposure has been found to be effective for agoraphobia and OCD. Finally, interoceptive exposure has been found effective for reducing anxiety associated with panic attacks, PTSD, and other anxiety-related disorders. So that means using strategies that are designed to evoke the feared bodily cues that are associated with fear and anxiety reactions so sitting in a chair, breathing in a paper bag, cardiovascular exercise, for example. So people learn, I can feel dizzy, my heart can be racing, I can be out of breath, and I'm okay. Because it's no longer associated with the doctor's office or the elevator. You can sit with that therapist and say, hey, I'm out of breath and I'm actually okay. All right, so that's a lot of information on in vivo exposure with response prevention. What about implosive therapy? Like in vivo exposure with response prevention, implosive therapy is based on the assumption that certain events, conditions, stimuli are consistently avoided to reduce the anxiety that prolonged exposure would cause. Implosive therapy is conducted in the imagination and involves presenting the feared stimulus vividly enough so it arouses high levels of anxiety. Stampful, uh, let's move on to the next slide. Stampful is the main developer of the implosive therapy technique, and he believed that avoiding behaviors is learned during childhood, and that it actually, you know, there might be a fear of snakes, but it also represents a conflict that's related to sexual or aggressive impulses. So consequently, the images that you use during implosive therapy are embellished with psychodynamic themes. A snake-phobic client, for example, might be asked to imagine a scene that not only involves a personal encounter with a snake, but that also emphasizes the sexual symbolism of snakes. Research showed, however, that it really does seem like the factor that is helpful in implosive therapy is the um, exposure to that imagined fearful stimulus and counter-conditioning more than the sexual interpretation. Finally, we're going to talk about EMDR. There isn't a slide for this one. EMDR was originally developed as an intervention for PTSD, but it's now used to treat a variety of symptom, uh, symptoms and disorders like panic attacks, phobias, depression, and substance use. It's based on this assumption that when you're exposed to trauma, you are blocked from a very adaptive information processing mechanism that is neurophysiological. So by combining rapid lateral eye movements, which are believed to trigger that mechanism, with exposure to other tech, with exposure to the trauma or fear, with techniques drawn from CBT or psychodynamic, that together it can 
treat the trauma and reopen access to that information processing. There is controversy. It has been found to be effective for PTSD, but there's controversy as to whether this has anything to do with the eye movements, which seems and sounds a little silly, but you know what? Any, you never know. Um, based on results of meta-analysis of research, Davidson and Parker have concluded that the eye movements may be unnecessary and that it's really about imaginal exposure. Here's your key terms. Positive reinforcement, thinning satiation, prompts fading, shaping versus chaining, the PREMAT principle, differential reinforcement, punishment habituation, overcorrection, response cost, timeout, and functional behavioral assessment. Remember the four quadrants of reinforcement punishment and then also positive negative from learning theory. Positive means you add something. Negative means you take it away. If you're reinforcing something, you want to increase that target behavior. If you're punishing something, you want to decrease that target behavior. So think about that when you look at the exam questions of what exactly the tar target behavior was because it can trip you up a little bit if you don't pay attention. So what are your treatment approaches based on operant conditioning? You have approaches that are based on reinforcement. You have ba approaches based on punishment. Obviously, some of these combine both. And then you want to think about classical extinction, which we've talked about already, but specifically it's operant when you are preventing the escape response, the avoidance response that is key to um, maintaining sometimes these uh, maladaptive behaviors. And also there's a number of ways that we can work to modify behavior. Um, important to know, we'll talk more about it, but functional assessment of behavior where you determine what the target is, you see what comes before, what comes after, what's reinforcing, what's punishing it, and then you kind of start manipulating how things are rewarded and punished from what the current status is, but we'll say more about that. Um, basically, these interventions involve increasing a desirable behavior using reinforcement and decreasing something undesirable with punishment or extinction. So it's pretty much that simple. There are three kinds of reinforcement to know about. There's primary reinforcers, secondary reinforcers, and generalized condition reinforcers. Primary is something like food where you, across all ages and cultures, it will um, reinforce. Something secondary, you might acquire at a different developmental stage, but it's not automatic. And praise is a really good example of something secondary. We start to learn, we want approval, and that when someone goes, good job, that means, oh yeah, you did good. So we start to develop that good job is going to come with good things. And generalized condition is something that gives access to other reinforcers. So unless you happen to love how money tastes or something, um, which is its own bad, probably its own conditioned response, but unless you happen to love how money tastes, it's going to be a generalized condition because it gives you access to a wonderful dinner out or gives you access to praise because people think you're so awesome for having it, but it in itself really has little value, even if we have a classically conditioned response to feel good when we see a lot of it in our hand. So let's talk about what influences reinforcement. Um, both positive and negative reinforcement are useful for increasing behaviors. Um, but most behavioral interventions rely on positive reinforcement. Uh, the effectiveness of positive reinforcement is influenced by a number of factors. Contingency, is there actually a contingent relationship between the target behavior and the positive reinforcer? So the reinforcer, like your um, pedicure, should only be available when you have done your target behavior. Otherwise, it doesn't, it kind of loses its value. Um, and its relationship as well. Um, immediacy. The reinforcer should be delivered immediately after the target behavior. This is particularly important when you're trying to establish a new behavior. So if you think about training a dog, if you wait 30 seconds, they don't know what you're rewarding them for anymore. This is a little different when you have uh, human cognition to be able to maintain that connection. But um, <clears throat> shouldn't be underplayed how important it is to do this immediately. You'll see on the right, the schedule of reinforcement is an uh, important factor in how effective it is. 
we've talked about this in learning theory, but really important to know for the licensing exam, it probably will come up. You need to know how quickly these different, how quickly they work, how to identify if something's fixed or variable um, interval or ratio. And you really need to know about the scalloped pattern. So, um, yeah, variable ratio, quickest. You never know when it's going to come, so you just keep emitting the desired behavior. With fixed ratio, um, right after you get your reward, you kind of, there's a downtick um, in response. With both, with anything fixed, there's a downtick. But with fixed ratio, right after you're like, ah, I got my whatever, I'm taking a break. And then as you get closer to where you can anticipate that, you know, you're going to get that reward, you up your behavior. With variable interval, with variable, again, it's constant because you have no idea or you have um, little idea of when you're going to have it. So if it's approximately every five minutes, but it's not exactly five minutes, you just don't know. With fixed interval, then there's um, a more sloped scallop to it, which is uh, after five minutes, then you'll start slowly going down and then slowly going back up. Um, but because ratio, you acquire the behavior faster, you probably, when it's fixed, how, you know, you know you've got to get back on it, but you take a quick little break. Um, so that schedule of reinforcement, when you reduce the proportion of reinforcement, that's called thinning. Magnitude. Up to a point, the greater the amount of positive reinforcement, the greater its effectiveness. But there's a point at which you get satiated. The doggy's tummy is full of treats, and the reinforcer loses its reinforcing value. Primary reinforcers like food are more susceptible than secondary, like praise, and the continuous schedule of reinforcement is more susceptible to satiation than intermittent. I mean, granted, if you're getting treats every single time, you're going to more quickly get sick of them or full. Verbal clarification. If you can really clarify that these things are contingent verbally, it enhances effectiveness, and prompts. Verbal and physical prompts facilitate acquisition. So when a prompt signals that the behavior is going to be reinforced, hey, I'm going to give you that cookie if you finish setting the table, um, that, is, that will serve as discriminative, discriminative stimulus that, hey, things are going to follow this behavior. When you, stop or when you start removing the prompts, the kid just knows they're going to get that cookie, then that's fading. So you're fa fading, reminding, they know their cookie's coming. Now, what would it be called if you faded or you stopped giving them the cookies or you started giving the cookies less? That would be thinning because you're reinforcing it with that unconditioned stimulus um, more and more. So, let's talk about when you use reinforcement to increase a response, it's necessary to wait for the response to actually happen to emit it. Now, if you are an abstract thinking adult, it shaping doesn't come into play as much um, because you can say, hey, touch your finger to your nose and you can understand that cognitively and do it. But for something that either rarely never occurs or if you have an animal or a child, shaping can be used. That means that you reinforce successive approximations to this desired behavior. So you get reinforcement as you come closer and closer to what you're actually supposed to be doing. So here's an example. And this is actually teaching mute children with autism or schizophrenia to, to speak because you can see there's um, a little bit of a change in cognition from an abstract thinking adult. Training begins with having the child imitate the trainer's voice to encourage, um, so to encourage as the child's reinforced simply by looking at the trainer's mouth. But when the child's accomplished this task, the trainer modeled the sound and reinforced the child only when he or she made a vocalization. 
Eventually, the child's reinforced only for imitating the particular sound. And then once the sound is mastered, the trainer introduces a new sound, and this procedure was continued until the child's able to say words and speak in simple sentences. Um, with a pup, that could look like anytime they get close to their ball, then they get a treat. Then it can be, once they've really mastered that, it's when they touch the ball with their nose, they get a treat. And when they've mastered that, it's when they pick it up and bring it to you. So it progressively. So chaining seems similar, but it is actually different than shaping. Skinner described this as three-term contingency, the sequence of discriminative stimulus behavior consequence he says this is what accounts for actually the acquisition of most complex behaviors, including behavior chains, which consist of a number of distinct responses. So making a cake would be an example, or eating a plate of food, let's say. Um, first, if you're a kid eating a plate of food, this is actually not, it's not, there's actually a number of steps to it. First, you have to pick up your fork. Next, you have to learn to scoop some of that food onto your fork, get some you know, get it on there. You need to learn how to get that fork to your mouth. You need to learn to chew your food. You need to swallow. So some of those are pretty automatic. A cake is an example that is um, a little bit more complex. But the establishment of both of these behaviors are referred to as chaining. Um, you really get your big reinforcer, such as eating that food, it going into your tummy, or getting to eat your cake at the end of the chain. Um, and chaining can happen forward or backward, so you can start with the first component, like teaching the kid how to hold a fork or a spoon. Um, but you can also use the reverse order. And in this example, it's a little bit harder, but you could think you put the food in the kid's mouth um, first. Then maybe you have the spoon is already in their mouth and you teach them to hold it. So you could go backwards or forwards. It's sometimes confused with shaping, and that's because they both have to do with establishing complex behaviors. But only the final behaviors of interest in shaping. So I want the dog to be able to bring me that ball. Um, but mm, yeah, I don't need her to be able to be near a ball. I don't need all of that kind of stuff. But in chaining, um, you every step of that is important. So the pup getting the ball might be um, a behavior chain, but teaching her the word ball is shaping. Okay, let's talk about token economies. So a token economy is a structured environment in which Desirable behaviors are increased by reinforcing them with tokens, which are generalized secondary reinforcers. Um, they can be exchanged for desired items, activities, and other backup primary reinforcers, like food. Undesirable behaviors are decreased by withholding or even removing the tokens following those behaviors. Establishment of a token economy involves a number of things. You've got to define what the target behaviors are. So here on this sheet, you can see cleaning up toys, using nice words, and playing with the dogs gently are the target behaviors. You select the secondary and backup reinforcers. Um, so the little stickers are your um, secondary reinforcers. You develop a system for monitoring it, so you can see there's this little chart on the wall that the kid and the parent can see, or if it's at an institution, you can see it at school or wherever else as well. And then finally, you develop a plan for reducing and then eliminating the reinforcers. So at some point, this kid isn't going to get a sticker chart, stickers for cleaning up their toys, um, you know, until they're 18 years old. So at some point, this would have to get thinned. They have several, this has several advantages. First, there's an immediate delivery of reinforcement for small things. Um, secondly, you can tailor it to the person so they can select their own backup reinforcers. And third, 
because tokens can be exchanged for a variety. Um, in this example, there's just one, but because they could be exchanged for not only Angry Birds, but Mario Kart, they're less susceptible than primary reinforcers to satiation. So if the kid gets sick of Angry Birds, you can just switch it to a different game or whatever you guys decide together that you want to use. Contingency contracts. Application of reinforcement to naturalistic environment addresses problematic interactions and negotiate contracts. So what does that all mean? This is an application of contingency management that involves a formal written agreement between two or more people. So it could be the therapist and the client. It also could be teacher and students, etc. And you clearly define the behaviors that are to be modified and the rewards and punishments that will follow performance of them. So behavior change may, re may be required by one or all parties um, to the contract. So let's give an example. If you have a therapist and client, then um, you'd require behavior change really by the client only. But if you have a contract between two spouses, then both people need to be making changes. According to Stewart and Lott, there are five elements necessary that this is going to be effective contract. Okay, first, explicit definitions of what each party is going to receive as a result of meeting responsibilities. Second, there should be sanctions that are clear if you don't meet the contract's terms. Third, behaviors need to be something that can be monitored. So be nice. You really need to operationalize what that means to be nice. So if it's complimenting five times a day, then that's something you can monitor. Um, fourth, the contract should define bonuses for consistent compliance with the terms of the contract. So if it's meditation, um, Let's say you, you and your spouse agree that you're both going to meditate every day. If you meditate five days in a row, there's a bonus for having done so consistently. And the fifth is a record-keeping system to keep giving feedback to both parties about the frequency of behaviors and also so you can actually deliver the appropriate reinforcers. They're most effective when the person whose behavior is to be modified is actively participating in the development of the contract because uh, if this is getting handed to you by your teacher, that there's going to be more resistance. They're not fully on board. So there might be some good to it, but in general, it's not um, completely helpful. The PREMAC principle, which we've gone over in learning theory, is when you have a high probability behavior used to reinforce a low probability behavior. A therapist would be using this to increase the amount of time a student spends studying when, after learning that there's a lot of TV watching, the therapist says, look, you can watch TV, but only after you study for one hour. So in that situation, watching TV is the high probability behavior, and it's being used to reinforce studying, which is, I guess, a lower probability behavior for this child. And hopefully that increases study time. This is particularly useful when it's difficult to identify a stimulus that would act as a reinforcer for a particular individual. So if if the kid already gets to watch a lot of TV, um, and there's not really, this kid doesn't really want for anything, then you can really think of, okay, here's something they're already doing. This is already something that's reinforcing to them, and you make it contingent with something low probability. Differential reinforcement of other behaviors. Um, so there's a few terms here you can see. DRO is di differential reinforcement of other behaviors, but DRI is differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors, and DRA is differential reinforcement of alter alternative behaviors. So there are those are different varieties, but the basic story is here you're combining positive reinforcement with extinction. So um, just normal what we talked about before in the classical conditioning section, um, or did we talk about in classical conditioning, when we talked about how you pair, but you also don't allow the person to escape, the, avoid what they're doing, and that's an integration of classical and operant. Here is not just um, that you're removing the negative reinforcer, which is escaping. Um, you have a target behavior that you are that you're positively reinforcing. 
Um, what you're going to do is you're going to reinforce alternative behaviors and ignore the target behavior. So for the target behavior, right, you're removing reinforcement. There's no punishment, you're just removing reinforcement, which could involve, you know, not letting them escape. So it could involve being in that elevator. They have, it's going through extinction because they're not, they're not escaping. Or the kid who cries in class to get attention, crying's no longer getting, getting um, attention. Um, but the target behavior of riding the elevator gets positively reinforced. Or the target behavior of being good in class gets positively reinforced. So when the kid's not crying, they get lots more attention from the teacher. Um, another example is a child who has stereotyped hand movements, which are very self-reinforcing, can, can get nickels and tokens for every two-minute period that they play with their toys rather than having the hand movements. So the playing with toys is being re reinforced, and then the hand movements, so the negative aspect of it, is being extinguished. So that negative reinforcer is taken away, um, and now we have no pairing happening, which is what extinction is all about. There are the different varieties that we talked about. Um, and in general, this can be good for working with kids in classroom situations. Finally, let's talk about social skills training. Social skills training is used to improve communication, assertiveness, problem solving, all sorts of things that have to do with being socially adaptive. And this is a type of behavior therapy. And it's different from, it's not just operant though, it's classical operant and social. So it's really kind of coming at things from all angles to focus on better social skills. So that might include modeling, coaching, uh, rehearsal, feedback, reinforcement, assignments, all sorts of techniques and the idea is that it has to do with using this techniques to develop social skills. We know that people are getting less natural life training being behind the computer with Facebook, especially kids who maybe didn't grow up and have that, that socialization and now they're behind the screen and maybe skills are lagging but they're there. So kids especially might really need a lot more informal social skills training if not social. This can help with schizophrenia, conduct problems, depression in all ages, and is really great when incorporated into a multimodal treatment. Functional behavior analysis. Um, this, these are interventions to behavior change that result, um, well, functional Function-based interventions are the result of a functional behavior analysis. Um, and these are also, these are basically conducted to determine, all right, some kid is hitting the wall in class. You are really wanting to look closer, like they're doing this undesirable thing. We wanted to substitute something more desirable, but you have to know what they're getting out of that. Are they getting approval from their peers? Are they getting attention from the teacher? Are they getting attention from their parents when they go home? So to do that, um, you might have observation, indirect or direct. You can have interviews and just any sorts of data that can give you, give you information about the behavior and what the ante antecedents and consequences of it are. The ultimate goal is to decrease or eliminate undesirable and increase something alternative. So it's not just extinguishing a fear response with PTSD, um, it's really having very specified and alternative behavior that's desired. So with PTSD, it really could be, you could think of it as the alternative behavior is relaxation. Um, so it is possible to think of it that way. But let's say with dogs um, and the bell, with Pavlov's experiments, that the bell no longer creates it. That's not a functional behavior analysis. Functional behavior analysis, you also want to increase something positive because there's something not positive happening. So, with school psychologists might do that if there's a lot of issues with a particular student and talk to the student, talk to their teachers, go watch the class, 
Um, and maybe they find out, hey, when he's doing something really a boring task, he's doing that to avoid working on the boring thing. So well, how could you intervene then? Well, maybe you can modify their assignments, give them more of a choice, give them a way to complete them that's going to help them to be more interested and reinforce them for staying on task so they're not, so that avoidant, the not having to do it was reinforcing them before, but maybe now they get cookies when they do their task or what, whatever, probably not cookies in that case. So then the psychologist is going to evaluate the effectiveness using a single subject design to compare their frequency of on-task behaviors during baseline and treatment phases. Self-reinforcement. Um, Self-reinforcement is when you are administering the reinforcement to yourself. So this is probably something, this is something kids do for sure, but um, I think it especially brings up the image of adults who are trying to do weight loss or trying to lose weight, and they monitor themselves um, using records. There's apps on the phone now, and they start to uh, also control their environment stimulus that they encounter uh, to narrow the range of responses. So. Two self-management procedures is just you know, self-monitoring and stimulus control. Those are the two, two pieces to really know. Um, self-monitoring is what you usually do initially, and uh, this is done with CBT a lot. You're recording things, getting information about the nature and magnitude of the behavior, and that also can help you develop what your treatment is going to be before you kind of move on to stimulus control and all of that kind of stuff. Stimulus control basically means that your behavior is under stimulus control when doing it is contingent on the presence of something else. So, you know, cigarette smoking is contingent or controlled by things like drinking coffee, talking with friends, being alone, um, or having even having a pack of cigarettes. So when you want to use a stimulus control technique, you're altering your associations between the stimulus and the behavior. So narrow, um, narrowing is restricting the target behavior to a limited set of stimuli. So you can only smoke, um, only smoke at 5 p.m. after work. Um, that's not a great one because usually people who are smoking are trying to get rid of it altogether. But let's say with trying to lose weight, you only eat at meal times. You're not snacking and running into the kitchen and putting your hand in the bag of chips all the time. Cue strengthening. That's when you link a behavior to specific environmental conditions. Eating means sitting at the table, um, sitting at the table. Studying, if you want to increase something like studying, then you cue strengthen. So when you go in, at, to your desk in the office, you study. So cue strengthening is more about increasing this particular behavior. Narrowing is usually restricting, restricting the target behavior to a limited set of stimuli. And fading consists of changing the stimulus conditions associated with the behavior. So um, this might be when a cat is trying to chew on your hand, you put a cat toy in their mouth. Um, and this could also work if you have fetish objects, give them something more appropriate. All right, let's talk about aversive control of behavior. Four things to know. Positive punishment it suppresses behavior, but doesn't necessarily eliminate it. Escape learning. You're going to, you actually, this is where you stop the aversive stimulus from happening by doing something else first. So you can make bad stop by doing what you need to do. So if you're getting shocked, you can hit the stop button. So I think I kind of misspoke there. You, you don't, the avoidance learning is when you pay your bill and you're not going to get the punishment. So you can do something good, pay the bill, and then you don't have to encounter the aversive stimulus. Escape learning, however, the aversive thing happens. You get shocked, but there's a way, but there's something you can do to stop that. You can hit the stop button, for example. And overcorrection is when you get punished, but you also have to, um, there's restitution and repair. You do more than even... Um, 
fix the very specific thing that you did. So we'll talk more about that. But let's talk about punishment because the, some of these include elements of punishment, whether you're avoiding the punishment and avoidance learning or you're escaping the punishment or your behavior is going down because of punishment. Factors that influence punishment, the sooner the better. Be consistent, continuous schedule. Moderate intensity. If it's too strong, you're not going to get what you want. Avoidance, or you could even get angry, uh, acting out even further. You don't want to do gradual increasing of the punishment because then people can get habituated and it's not effective. Um, similar to reinforcement, verbally clarifying. It's, the effect is maximized when that contingent relationship is made really clear verbally. Remove all positive reinforcement. Well, punishment's going to work best when you're only getting punished or not getting reinforced as well. So make sure that that is also withheld. Reinforcement for alternate behavior. So this could be in your differential reinforcement category. But because punishment's teaching a person what not to do, it really is more effective if you can also combine it with reinforcement for what to do. Um, it's important to determine if that undesirable behavior is actually just because the person has inadequate skills. Because if you punish someone and they don't really know what else to do, then they need to get trained in those skills before the punishment's going to have any sort of really great effect. So overall, if we think about this, the use of punishment is um, mixed for a number of reasons. It's certainly It's been criticized for ethical, legal, and practical reasons. With, for ethical reasons, some authorities consider punishment and other aversive techniques to be always unethical, but some think, you know what, if no other treatments are effective and the target behavior is really harmful, then it might be better to punish than let them keep going if it's really your only option. Um, if someone's going to kill themselves with alcohol use, if someone is molesting children, these are cases where maybe the punishment not necessarily fits the crime, but punishment is better for fixing the crime. Also, in terms of practical considerations, you have to keep in mind that it really is suppressing a behavior and not eliminating it. So if a person learns when that punishment is going to occur and then engages in the behavior when it's going to when it's going to incur, then that's unlikely, but they might go do it some other time. Punishment's also associated with several negative side effects, including fear of the punishing agent and increases in aggressiveness, negative emotions escape because this person is getting treated. What are, I mean, when you are punished in life, that has impacts on you socially and emotionally, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about the world. So it's a little bit more complicated than, yay, reinforce, yay, punish. There's other things that you touch when you're reinforcing and punishing. And punishment, the negative effects of punishment really highlights that. Let's okay, let's talk about types of punishment. Verbal rep reprimands, overcorrection, negative practice, and response cost, as well as timeout reinforcement. So let's go through these pretty quickly. Verbal reprimands. What might be a way you'd reprimand someone? Say no. Say stop. This is a meant to suppress unwanted behaviors in a variety of settings. But it's kind of inconsistent because reprimands can act as positive reinforcers and actually increase behavior sometimes. So if you're a kid who's not getting a lot of attention, then your mom yelling at you might not be the best kind of attention, but it's attention. Reprimands are you also probably only going to cause temporary impact. You need to back it up with other things. Overcorrection is a form of positive punishment when the punishment, you're going to have to do something or something's getting added. And it can involve either um, one of two things. Restitution is the first, and that means that you have the individual correct any negative effects of their behavior. Um, and positive practice requires the person to practice more appropriate behaviors usually in an exaggerated fashion. Overcorrection often involves providing verbal instructions, and it might require constant supervision or manual guidance through the corrective behaviors, which can be problematic because that can also illustrate 
um, avoidant and aggressive behaviors in themselves. So in this picture, you see a little woman, a little kid giving her a massage. Well, maybe they were screaming and running around the kitchen and driving her absolutely batty. And she said, if you don't stop, then you got to give your mom a foot massage. So in some ways, this is an overcorrection because let's say stress was what they were causing their mom. Well, they have to sort of make reparations for that behavior. And they are certainly um, being, there's a manual element to that there. So they've, there's a restitution here. They're correcting the negative effects. And positive practice of practicing more appropriate behaviors, well, Maybe this isn't something they should be doing with their mom all the time, but it is maybe a little bit more appropriate to the mom than yelling and screaming is. Fox and Azrin treated a hospitalized woman with severe retardation who constantly disrupted the ward by throwing things and overturning her bed. So when the woman engaged in this behavior, what they ha did was required her to straighten the entire room, which is restitution, and then to practice more desirable behaviors such as making up all the beds on the ward. So maybe they, so maybe with these kids, they had to say sorry to their mom. That was part of the restitution before they had the overcorrection piece, which is like get, giving mom a foot bread is definitely um, above and beyond, but hopefully helpful in learning and fun for mom. Negative practice is essentially the opposite of the positive practice component of overcorrection, and it involves requiring the individual to deliberately repeat the undesirable behavior to the point that it becomes aversive to the individual or the person is fatigued. It's especially useful for eliminating habits and other behaviors they'd like to eliminate, like nail biting, hair twisting, pick up, motor tics, stuttering, smoking. So as an example, when you, when used to when used to eliminate a motor tic, you are supposed to practice your tic rather than trying to suppress it. And then when it when it does occur, you repeat it for a specified period of time. So you get really sick of it, hopefully. Response cost is an application of negative punishment and it involves removing a specific reinforcer every time the target behavior is performed. Although response cost is most commonly associated with token economies, you lose your tokens, it can be used whenever the control of positive reinforcers is possible. So a parent can use it to reduce the misbehavior of their child by taking away their computer privileges for a specified period of time. Or you could decrease the allowance every time the child engages that behavior. Other examples are fines for traffic violations and late fees for paying credit card bills after the due date. Timeout is our final one. This involves removing all sources of positive reinforcement for a brief pre-specified period of time. Teacher could do that to eliminate disruptive behaviors, Put a, have a little part of the corner where you sit for five minutes, and it's usually classified as type uh, negative punishment but it's also considered to be a form of extinction. However, note that extinction entails continuous removal of a reinforcer from a previously reinforced response, while timeout involves removing all reinforcement for a specified period um, following a behavior that may or may not have been established or maintained by reinforcement. We don't know. Um, an evaluation of timeout. It, some research suggests the duration really doesn't matter Short timeouts are effective and longer ones um, are, are effective as longer ones. The optimal is considered to be 5 to 10 minutes. Like other forms of punishment, timeouts most effective when combined with reinforcement for alternative behaviors. So if timeout begins with a brief explanation of why it is being applied. Um, that's a verbal clarification as well. And is there any, if you want to differentially reinforce um, or not differentially reinforced, but if you wanted to add something, a positive behavior, you could teach the child to meditate when they're sitting there. That's probably not going to go great with a little kid. But maybe if you have a teenager who loves Buddhism, who is somehow getting timeouts, that would be an example. So a treatment approach based on social learning theory. Would, this has to do with modeling, because in social learning theory, you learn through modeling. Um, this could be symbolic, it could be live or in vivo, or it could be participant modeling. So symbolic, you watch a movie about, um, you watch a movie of how to do something like read. I'm trying to think of something that's maybe more therapy applicable. 
live or in vivo is maybe in therapy, the therapist actually demonstrates doing whatever it is. And participant is whoever is the model of it helps walk that person through. So if it was sports, watching someone kick a soccer ball live, there's someone, you're on a field and you're getting to watch someone kick a soccer ball. Participant modeling, you've got someone walking you through it and helping you learn to kick it with your body. Decreasing behavior with extinction. That means that you're going to withhold reinforcement for something that used to be reinforced. This is why timeouts are not necessarily fully extinction because you're just removing all reinforcers. This behavior might not have been specifically reinforced by something that you're taking away. But with extinction, yes. Taking away something that was getting reinforced before. The effectiveness is influenced by three things. Consistency, well, four things, I should say. Consistency, schedule, magnitude, and reinforcement for other behaviors. For it to be effective, it's got to be consistently withheld following the behavior. Because if you do a single exception, it can reestablish the behavior and maintain it for a considerable length of time. It's often difficult to identify and consistently withhold all sources. So reinforce extinction can be slow and frustrating, especially with dogs. Schedule of reinforcement that has been previously established and maintained the behavior affects the rate of extinction. Uh, you can probably guess it's more rapid when the behavior has been reinforced on a continuous schedule than on an intermittent one, and the intermittent, intermittent schedule is when a fixed or variable is used. Uh, interval schedule is used. Magnitude and duration. The greater the magnitude and the longer the duration of the previous reinforcement, the more resistant the behavior is going to be to extinction. And like punishment, extinction is most successful when it's used in conjunction, conjunction with reinforcement for alternative behaviors. Key concepts in cognitive learning theory are latent learning, Tolman, insight learning, Kohler, observational learning with Bandura, which consists of guided participation and self-efficacy, and learned helplessness model, um, both the original and reformulated versions. The key characteristics of the learning theories classified as cognitive are their stress on the internal thought processes that occur during learning and their rejection of the notion that external reinforcement is a necessary condition for learning to occur. Tolman proposed that learning often takes place without being manifested in performance improvements, i.e. learning can be latent. In one of the original studies on latent learning, Tolman and Hanzik in 1930 had three groups of rats run a maze once a day for several weeks. Group A always found food in the maze's goal box, group B never found food, and group C found no food until the 11th and subsequent days. As expected, during the first 10 days, group A rats outperformed group B and C who performed similarly. However, after the 11th day, the performance of group C rats was actually superior to that of group A. Tolman concluded that group C rats had learned something about the maze during the first 10 days, i.e. the rats had formed cognitive maps without being reinforced for doing so. He argued that these results show that latent learning occurs and that reinforcement may, may be an important factor in the performance of a response, but it's not necessary for the learning of that response. Insight learning. Gestalt psychology includes a model of learning that incorporates the role of internal cognitive processes, and this model was the basis for a series of studies conducted by Kohler with chimpanzees. In one study, Kohler gave a caged chimpanzee named Sultan two sticks that could be joined together to make a longer stick. A banana placed outside Sultan's cage could be reached only when the sticks were joined. After several unsuccessful attempts to reach the banana with only one stick, Sultan paused for a brief period and then suddenly joined the sticks together and used the longer stick to reach the banana. Kohler argued that this behavior demonstrates that learning can be a result of insight, an aha experience, and he proposed that insight learning reflects an internal cognitive restructuring of the perceptual field or environment that enhances the organism's ability to achieve its goals. Bandura in 1986 had the theory of observational learning, which is also known as social learning theory and social cognitive theory. It proposes that most complex human behaviors are learned by observing another person perform those behaviors, and that observational learning is useful not only for teaching new behaviors, but also for enhancing or inhibiting existing ones. 
Bandura's theory was originally derived from studies in which boys and girls observed an adult model act either aggressively or non-aggressively toward an inflated clown, or a bobo doll. Subsequently, children who observed the aggressive model displayed aggressive behaviors toward the doll, while children who had viewed the non-aggressive model did not exhibit such behaviors. This research also found that, among children who observed the aggressive model, a. Boys were more likely to imitate a male model, while girls were more likely to imitate a female model. B. Boys and girls imitated the verbally aggressive behaviors of the model similar to a similar degree, but boys were more likely than girls to imitate the physical. And C. Providing incentives for imitating the aggressive model reduced the gender difference in the imitation of physically aggressive behavior. Some more on Bandura's theory of observational learning um, can be found in the learning theory uh, section. However, just to briefly overview, Bandura said that there is an alteration in cognition that involves four processes, attending to, um, coding and retaining the information through rehearsal, being able to then reproduce and rehearse it, and finally, even though learning can occur, to actually perform it, it requires motivation. So that's the process. Um, also important are different characteristics of the model. When it's used to treat phobic reactions, coping models who inhibit, who exhibit apprehension first and overcome it are more effective. Um, guided participation is a procedure um, in participant modeling, and the learner observes the model perform and then performs themselves with assistance. Self-efficacy is a central concept in Bandura's theory, and this refers to a person's belief about their ability to perform a behavior or task to achieve goals. And Bandura says that these beliefs are a primary source of information impacted by four different informational sources, inactive attainment, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, and emotional and physiological states. Some research suggests that the effectiveness of guided participation is due to the improvement in self-efficacy that's provided by successful performance of the target responses. Finally, reciprocal determinism. Reciprocal determinism is another important aspect. It predict predicts that there's a reciprocal, both interactive and influential relationship between the environment, overt behaviors, and cognitive, affective, and other personal characteristics. In contrast to other behavioral theories, the learned helplessness model is not a general theory of learning, but instead applies to the cognitive processes associated with depression. Learned helplessness refers to the tendency to give up any effort to control events in the environment and was first observed in animals that have been exposed to uncontrollable electric shock <coughs> and subsequently did not even try to escape the shock when it was possible to do so. It was subsequently suggested as an etiological factor in some forms of depression. According to the reformulated version, attributional reformulation, of the learned helplessness model, depression occurs when, depressed when a person makes internal, stable, and global attributions for negative events. In other words, depressed people attribute the cause of negative events to themselves, believe that they will always cause negative events to happen to them, and think they cause negativity in all aspects of their lives. The Learn Helplessness Model was again revised by Abr Abramson, Matalski, and Alloy in 89, who acknowledged the role of attributions in depression, but proposed that attributions are important only to the extent to which they contribute to the person's sense of hopelessness. So now we're moving into the cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, Key concepts are rational emotive behavior therapy with Albert Ellis um, as a place to start. Um, Ellis's approach is REBT, and it conceptualizes emotions and behaviors in terms of a chain of events. He has an active, the therapist plays an active role, and it is about persuasion and logical disputation. The chain of events is thought of as ABC, where A is the external activating event to which the individual is exposed, B is the belief that individual has about A, and C is the emotion or behavior that results from B. In other words, an emotional or behavioral response to an external event is due to beliefs about that event rather than the event itself. <clears throat> According to Ellis, 
The primary cause of neurosis is the continual repetition of certain common irrational beliefs, such as the belief that it is necessary to be loved by everyone or the belief that one should be thoroughly competent, intelligent, and achieving in all respects. Irrational beliefs are characterized by dogmatic demands, musts and shoulds, awfulizing, it's awful if, low frustration tolerance, and negative evaluations of oneself and others. As defined by Ellis, irrational beliefs are the results of certain biological tendencies that include negativism, moodiness, and excitement-seeking, and that these interfere with the ability to think productively and rationally. In REBT, two more events, D and E, are added to the ABC chain. D is the therapist's attempt to dispute and alter the ira individual's irrational beliefs, and E refers to alternative thoughts and beliefs that result from D. To help clients replace irrational beliefs with more appropriate ones, therapists adopt an educational, confrontative, and persuasive approach and use a variety of techniques, including modeling, behavior rehearsal, problem solving, in vivo desensitization, rational emotive imagery, and cognitive homework assignments. Beck's so cognitive, cognitive therapy is also referred to as CBT therapy and was originally developed as a treatment for depression, but has since been successfully applied First, to a number of other disorders, schemas, including anxiety, These anorexia, are underlying bulimia, cognitive structures and rules that function of core and beliefs and that determine abuse. how individuals codify, the categorize, and interpret their experience. The primary goal of cognitive therapy is they revealed an automatic thought to help the client identify and alter a dysfunctional cognitive and schemas develop early in life as a result of biological, developmental, and environmental factors. They can be either functional or dysfunctional. And may be dormant until they're activated by internal or external stress, especially stress caused by conditions similar to those under which they originally developed. Once activated, dysfunctional schemas impair the ability to think rationally and predispose individuals to depression or other disorders. Automatic thoughts. These are surface-level cognitions that intercede between an event or stimulus and the individual's emotional and behavioral reactions. Automatic thoughts are not necessarily associated with psychological dysfunction, but they contribute to dysfunction when they're the result of maladaptive schemas and are frequent, persistent, and then not critically examined. Cognitive distortions. These are systematic errors or biases in information processing and are the link between maladap maladaptive cognitive schemas and negative automatic thoughts. Common distortions include arbitrary inference, which is when you draw conclusions without corroborative evidence, Overgeneralization, when you draw general conclusions on the basis of a single event. <coughs> Selective abstraction, attending to detail while ignoring the total context. Personalization, erroneously attributing external events to oneself. Dichotomous thinking, thinking in polarized either or ways. And emotional reasoning, believing things are a certain way because one feels they are that way. Like automatic thoughts, cognitive distortions become problematic when they are pervasive and are not critically examined or challenged. A cognitive profile. According to Beck, each psychological disorder is characterized by a different cognitive profile. For example, depression involves the cognitive triad of a negative view of oneself, the world, and the future while the cognitive profile for anxiety reflects an excessive form of normal survival techniques and consists of unrealistic fears about physical and psychological threats. Characteristics and strategies of cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy is distinguished from other CBT therapies by several characteristics. First, it relies on collaborative empiricism. This involves developing a collaborative therapist-client relationship and gathering evidence to test hypotheses about the client's beliefs and assumptions. Second, it is time-limited treatment with the average length of therapy being 15 sessions and sessions being structured and goal-oriented. With regard to the latter, the first session ordinarily addresses the following goals. A. Establishing rapport and trust. B. Socializing the client to cognitive therapy. C. Educating the client about their disorder, the cognitive model, and the therapy process. D. Normalizing the client's difficulties and instilling hope. E. Determining and, if necessary, correcting the client's expectations about therapy. F. Collecting additional information about the client's problems. And G. Developing a goal list. Third, while the focus of cognitive therapy is on the client's current experiences, historical material may be addressed to clarify his or her core beliefs. Fourth, cognitive therapy assumes that relevant cognitions become accessible and modifiable only with effect arousal, affect arousal, and consequently imagery and other techniques are used to elicit affect. Fifth, 
Questioning is a primary therapeutic tool and often takes the form of Socratic dialogue, which is also known as guided discovery, and involves asking questions that are designed to help the client reach logical conclusions about a problem and its consequences. Six, the relapse prevention is a focus throughout treatment. For instance, during the course of therapy, the therapist emphasizes the client's part in causing change in mood and behavior, and toward the end, the therapist works with the client to develop a self-therapy plan. CT incorporates a variety of behavioral therapy techniques. Behavioral strategies include activity scheduling, behavior rehearsal, social skills training, and relaxation. Cognitive strategies include the downward arrow, if so, then what? Questioning the evidence, decatastrophizing, mental imagery, and cognitive rehearsal. Clients are often given homework assignments, and an early assignment requires the client to keep a daily record of dysfunctional thoughts in order to identify the client's automatic thoughts. The specific techniques used in therapy depend on the nature and severity of the client's symptoms. For example, behavioral techniques designed to increase the client's overall activity level are often the initial interventions for clients with severe depression, while cognitive techniques are usually the initial interventions for those with mild to moderate depression. Depressogenic schemata. So current evolutions of cognitive behavioral therapy have actually begun, begun to integrate the body. Schema-focused therapy is a combination of CBT and Gestalt therapies, and this ends up forming a depth CBT model. So Mike and Baum and Cognitive Behavior Modification. Two programs associated with Mike and Baum's CBM are self-instructional training and stress inoculation training. Mike and Baum's approach tends to focus on self-statements or the verbalizations that clients make to themselves. Like Beck, his approach emphasizes collaboration in a Socratic style of questioning. The interventions described below are going to be Okay, so we're staying with Mike and Baum, actually, and we're going to start with his self-instructional training. Mike and Baum and Goodman in 71 originally used self-instructional training to help impulsive and hyperactive children perform academic and other tasks more successfully by teaching them to interpolate adaptive, self-controlling thoughts between a stimulus situation and their response to that situation. Self-instructional training, or SIT, incorporates the work of Vygotsky and Luria, who propose that true voluntary behavior does not occur until there's a shift from external to internal language control, as well as Bandura's work on observational learning. And there are five steps of the therapy. Cognitive modeling. The client observes a model perform the task while the model makes self-statements aloud. Self-statements include questions about the nature of the task, answer to those questions, specific instructions on how to do the task, and self-reinforcement. Second, cognitive participant modeling. The client performs the task as the model verbalizes the instruction. So you could also call that therapist verbalization. Overt self-instruction or patient verbalization. The client performs the task while instructing him or herself out loud. Fading overt self-instruction or a patient silently talks through task. The client whispers instructions while carrying out the task. And finally, covert self-instruction or independent task per performance. The client performs the task while saying the instructions covertly. There is a slight parallel here with protocol analysis. Protocol analysis is a procedure that's used when a person is learning a task and is asked to describe aloud the steps being taken to solve the task. Protocol analysis is used to gain access to people's problem-solving strategies. Stress inoculation training. This was designed to help people deal with stress by increasing their coping skills. Treatment involves three phases. One, the Cognitive preparation phase, also known as the conceptualization phase, it's primarily educational and involves helping the client understand his or her behavioral and cognitive responses to stressful situations. <coughs> B, during the skills acquisition and rehearsal phase, the client learns and rehearses a variety of coping skills. Specific interventions during this phase include direct action techniques like relaxation, pleasant imagery, arranging escape routes, and cognitive techniques replacing negative self-statements with coping self-statements. And C, in the final application and follow-through phase, the client applies the coping skills he or she has acquired to imagine, filmed, and in vivo stress-producing situations. 
So you can think of that as one, education and cognitive preparation, two, coping skills acquisition, and three, application of skills in imagination and in vivo. Now we're going to talk about other cognitive restructuring techniques in addition to Beck, Mike, and Baum, and Ellis. And the interventions described here are, um, they conceptualize maladaptive behaviors as the result of disturbances in thinking. They are narrower in focus and utilize a more restricted range of strategies. Thought stopping. Thought stopping entails eliminating obsessive rumination, self-criticism, depressive or anxiety arousing ideas, and really any other unwanted or unproductive thoughts by using such techniques as covertly yelling, stop, 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 or snapping a rubber band placed around the wrist whenever unwanted thoughts occur. Thought stopping is often combined with covert asser assertion, which involves making alternative assertive self-statements following thought stopping. Attribution retraining, another cognitive restructuring technique. Attribution retraining focuses on altering the individual's perceptions of the causes of their problematic behavior. And this has been successfully used to, to treat depression, anxiety, alcoholism, and several other disorders, as well as to improve the academic performance of underachieving students. Attribution retraining is consistent with the assumptions of the reformulated learned helplessness model and with optimistic explanatory style that is promoted in Seligman's theory of learned optimism. Its goal is to help clients attribute their failures to external, unstable, and specific factors and successes to internal, stable, and global factors. Problem-solving therapy. This is um, a way, these are cognitive behavioral strategies to help clients deal effectively with problematic external events. So stress inoculation is actually one of those. And then problem-solving therapy was originally described by De Zerilla and Goldfried in 1971. It's been updated many times since. Its most recent version, propo version proposes that problem-solving outcomes are determined primarily by two factors. One, problem orientation refers to relatively stable cognitive schemas that can be either positive or negative, and that represent the person's views about problems and his or her ability to su successfully solve them. Problem-solving style refers to the activities the individual engages in when solving problems. PST distinguishes between rational, impulsive, careless, and avoidant styles, with the rational style being identified as the only one that's likely to result in adaptive problem solutions. It's characterized by reliance on five skills. Recognizing the problem, defining the problem, generating alternate solutions, choosing the best solution, and implementing and evaluating the chosen solution. In therapy, several strategies are used to help clients adopt a positive problem-solving orientation and rational problem-solving style, including psychoeducation, guided discussion, role-playing, and homework assignments. REM self-control therapy is a brief form of therapy that is usually conducted as a group therapy. It's based on the assumption that deficits in three aspects of self-control increase a person's vulnerability to depression and make it difficult to deal effectively with depressive symptoms. So first is self-monitoring. Depressed people selectively attend to negative events and to the immediate versus delayed consequences of their behavior. Self-evaluation. People who are depressed make inaccurate internal attributions and compare their behavior to standards that are excessively rigid and perfectionistic. And finally, self-reinforcement. Depressed individuals engage in low rates of self-reward and high rates of self-punishment. Therapy sessions and behavioral homework assignments correspond to the three aspects of self-control. During the self-monitoring phase of therapy, the client's taught to monitor negative self-statements and positive outcomes. And during the self-evaluation phase, he or she is taught to set realistic goals and to make appropriate attributions for his or her behaviors. Then finally, during the self-reinforcement phase, the client learns to reinforce him or herself with positive self-statements and activities for working toward or achieving his or her goals. Lewins Lewinson's behavioral model attributes depression to a low rate of response contingent reinforcement due to inadequate reinforcing stimuli in the environment and or the individual's lack of skill in obtaining reinforcement. According to Lewinson, when a person's behaviors, for instance, attempts to interact with family members or coworkers, are not reinforced, those behaviors extinguish. 
He also proposed that in addition to eliminating or reducing certain behaviors, a low rate of response contingent reinforcement elicits pessimism, low self-esteem, and other features that are associated with depression. In terms of treatment, Lewinson initially focused on reactivating depressed patients by increasing their activity levels and access to reinforcing events, but subsequently incorporated cognitive techniques similar to those developed by Beck. Interestingly, however, there has been a renewed interest in recent years in behavioral activation approaches for depression that utilize behavioral strategies only. Biofeedback may be classified as a self-management technique since it involves having the client learn to modify his or her own behaviors and, like many other self-management procedures, is based on the principles of operant conditioning. The target in biofeedback training is usually a physiological response that is considered involuntary, such as heart rate, GSR, or galvanic skin response, skin temperature, brainwave activity, or blood glucose level. When using this technique, the client is connected to an electromyograph an electromyograph, an EMG, electroencephalograph, EEG, or other apparatus that provides immediate and continuous performance feedback about the target response. This is usually in the form of a visual or auditory signal. EMG feedback, for instance, is often used to treat tension headaches and involves training the person to relax the frontalist muscle in the forehead. When he or she does so, immediate feedback is provided. Biofeedback is commonly utilized in conjunction with relaxation training. The specific type of bio biofeedback selected depends on the client and the nature of the problem. Um, the mechanism of action for any of these, though, is a decrease in sympathetic arousal. Thermal biofeedback. This measures peripheral skin temperature and is commonly used to treat migraine headaches and Raynaud's disease. The goal of biofeedback is for the client to be able to increase peripheral temperature. Thermal biofeedback is commonly combined with autogenic training, which is a specific type of relaxation training that focuses on warmth and heaviness. EMG measures surface muscle tension, e.g. the forehead, jaw, lower back. EMG biofeedback is commonly used to treat clients with tension headaches, TMJ, and back pain with the goal of either reducing EMG levels or equalizing the tension in parallel muscle groups. EMG biofeedback is commonly combined with progressive or passive muscle relaxation training. It's also used for clients requiring neuromuscular rehabilitation secondary to a stroke, for example. EEG. EEG measures brain waves and is used to treat people suffering from hyperactivity or seizure disorders. GSR or galvanic skin response, also called electrodermal response, EDR. This measures skin conductivity or sweat. GSR can be used in the treatment of generalized anxiety. The goal is to decrease GSR levels. The research contrasting the effectiveness of biofeedback for different disorders has been somewhat inconsistent. A number of studies have found relaxation training to be as effective as biofeedback for several problems, including tension headaches, hypertension, general anxiety, insomnia, and lower back pain. There is evidence, however, that biofeedback may be the treatment of choice for some disorders. For example, Thermal biofeedback has been identified as an effective treatment for Raynaud's disease, which is characterized by a decrease in blood supply to the fingers and toes, while pelvic muscle, EMG biofeedback, has been successfully used to treat certain types of urinary and fecal incontinence. In addition, a combination of thermal biofeedback and autogenic training, which is a relaxation technique, has been found to be the best approach for migraine headaches. Marlott is a cognitive behaviorist who's well known for his model of relapse prevention. Unlike AA and other abstinence-based programs, Marlott views addiction as an overlearned habit and attempts to minimize the effects of relapses by teaching recovering addicts to view relapses as inevitable experiences <coughs> instead of review viewing recovery as all or nothing and a re relapse is due to lack of motivation or as a failure. The client is assisted to view each setback as a lapse to be learned from. Part of Marlott's model includes identifying and assisting addicts to identify the triggers for relapse, which may involve external factors, interpersonal situations, or internal states, such as thoughts, feelings, or physiological sensations. The most common relapse trigger is thought to be the client's negative emotional state. The client is then assisted to develop 
New skills or behaviors for dealing with triggers, like talking to a friend instead of using drugs. Linehan's Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Marsha Linehan's DBT is a structured outpatient therapy program for persons with borderline personality disorder. The dialectical point of view underlies the therapy, with the key dialect dialectic being acceptance on the one hand and change on the other. The therapy is behavioral, and although the past is not ignored, the therapy focuses on present behavior and the current factors that are controlling that behavior. Therapy requires that the client agree to the following four conditions to work in therapy for a specified period, typically a year, and within reason to attend all sessions. If suicidal behavior is present, to work on reducing this, to work on any behaviors that interfere with the course of therapy or therapy interfering behaviors, and to attend skills training. The primary modes of treatment in DBT include individual therapy, telephone contact, group skills training, and therapist consultation. Individual therapy, the individual therapist is the primary therapist with the main work of therapy being carried out during these sessions. Telephone contact is used to provide the client help and support in applying skills learned between sessions and to find, help find ways of avoiding self-injury. Skills training is carried out in the group context, typically with someone other than the individual therapist. The four groups of skills focused on are core mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance skills. Therapist consultation. Therapists are required to receive DBT from each other at regular therapist consultation groups. The therapies categorized as psychodynamic share several assumptions, including the following. Human behavior is motivated largely by unconscious processes. Early development has a profound effect on adult functioning. Universal principles explain personality development and behavior. And insight into unconscious processes is a key component of psychotherapy. Some of the psychodynamic psychotherapies include Freud's analysis, Adler's individual psychology, Jung's analytical psychotherapy, and the therapeutic approaches of the object relations theorists. So what about Freud and classical psychoanalysis? The worldview underlying Freud's psychoanalysis has been summarized as essentially pessimistic, deterministic, mechanistic, and reductionistic. I don't think ATABS likes Freud. Anyway, according to Freud, human beings are determined by irrational forces, unconscious motivations, biological and instinctual needs and drives, and psychosexual events that occurred during the first five years of life. Personality theory. Freud's personality theory consists of two separate but interrelated theories. There's a structural drive theory that you see here with the id, ego, and superego, and there's a developmental theory as well. So we'll talk first about the structural theory. And this posits that the it, there are three structures within the personality, the id, the ego, and the superego. The id is present at birth and consists of the person's life and death instincts, which serve as the source of all psychic energy. It operates on the basis of the pleasure principle and seeks immediate gratification of its instinctual drives and needs in order to avoid tension. The ego develops about six months of age in response to the id's inability to gratify all of its needs, and this operates on the basis of the reality principle. It defers gratification of the id's instincts until an appropriate object is available in reality and employs secondary process thinking, <coughs> which is characterized by realistic, rational thinking and planning. The primary task of the ego is to mediate the often conflicting demands of the id and reality, and once it has developed, the superego. Finally, the superego emerges when a child is between four and five years of age and represents the internalization of society's values and standards as conveyed to the child by his or her parents through rewards and punishments. In contrast to the ego, which postpones gratification of the id's instincts, the superego attempts to permanently block the id's socially unacceptable impulses. We can also look at these through a developmental perspective, and Freud emphasized the sexual drives of the id and proposed that the personality is formed during childhood as the result of certain experiences that occur during five predetermined psychosexual stages of development, oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital, also discussed in the lifespan section. During each stage, the id's libido and sexual energy is centered on a different part of the body, and as a result, over or under gratification of a person's sexual needs during each stage is associated with a different personality outcome. During the oral stage, for example, the id's sexual needs are gratified primarily by eating, drinking, and other activities involving the mouth. 
and the infant depends on others for gratification of its needs. Excessive frustration of the id's needs at this stage can lead to the development of an oral dependent personality. Anxiety is an essential component of Freud's personality theory. He described anxiety as an unpleasant feeling linked with the excitement of the autonomic nervous system and proposed that its function is to alert the ego to an impending internal or external threat, to danger arising from a conflict between its impulses and the demands of the superego or reality, or from an actual threat in the external environment. When the ego is unable to ward off danger through rational, realistic means, it may resort to one of its defense mechanisms, which share two characteristics. First, they operate on an unconscious level, and second, they serve to deny or distort reality. The most basic defense mechanism is repression, which underlies all other defense mechanisms and occurs when the ends, drives, and needs are excluded from conscious awareness by maintaining them in the unconscious. Other defense mechanisms include reaction formation, which involves avoiding an anxiety-evoking impulse by expressing its opposite, and projection, which occurs when a threatening impulse is attributed to another person or other external force, source. While the defense mechanisms can be considered adaptive because they serve to reduce anxiety, they may also lead to dysfunctional behavior when they become a habitual way of dealing with danger. So what is the view of maladaptive behavior? For Freudians, psychopathology stems from an unconscious, unresolved conflict that occurred during childhood. For instance, phobias are the result of displacement of anxiety onto an object or event that is symbolic of the object or event involved in the unresolved conflict. Depression is due to object loss coupled with anger toward the object turned inward, and mania represents a defense against libidinal or aggressive urges that threaten to overwhelm the ego. Displacement is frequently on the exam, so be sure to remember that. What about the therapy goals and techniques in psychoanalysis? The goal of psychoanalytic psychotherapy is to reduce or eliminate pathological symptoms by bringing the unconscious into conscious awareness and integrating previously repressed material into the personality. The primary technique is analysis, and the main targets of analysis are the client's free associations, dreams, resistances, and transferences. Underlying the analysis of these events is the assumption of psychic determinism, or the belief that all behaviors are meaningful and serve some psychological function. Freud believed, for instance, that slips of the tongue, parapraxies, are not meaningless accidents but expressions of unconscious motives. The analysis of free associations, dreams, resistances, and transferences consists of a combination of confrontation, clarification, interpretation, and working through. Confrontation entails making statements that help the client see his or her behavior in a new way. Clarification involves clarifying the client's feelings and restating his or her remarks in clearer terms. And interpretation goes a step further by more explicitly connecting current behavior to unconscious processes. Interpretations are less likely to elicit anxiety and resistance, and therefore more effective when they address motives and conflicts close to a client's consciousness than when they relate to mater material buried deep in the unconscious. Finally, improvement in psychoanalysis is attributed to a combination of catharsis, insight, and working through. Catharsis is the emotional release resulting from the recall <coughs> of unconscious material, and it paves the way for the client's insight into the relationship between his or her unconscious processes and current behaviors. Working through the final and longest stage in psychoanalysis allows the client to gradually assimilate new insights into his or her personality. Also important to remember that Freud delineating two kinds of mental functioning that you'll see in other forms of psychodynamic therapy. Examples include dreams and hallucinations for primary process. The chief characteristic of primary process functioning is an urgent attempt at tension reduction even at the expense of reality. Secondary process includes thinking and speaking. It's characterized by a focus on meeting the demands of reality and by the ability to delay gratification. We already talked about Freudian defense mechanisms. Um, Repression being the most common, regression, just to briefly go over what they are, um, regression is when you guard against anxiety by retreating, projection, seeing one's own unconscious urges in another, 
Displacement involves the transference of motions from the original object to some substitute or symbolic representation. This can be a factor in phobias. Reaction formation involves engaging in behaviors that are the exact opposite of the id's real urges. Intellectualization is distancing the self from, the fe from feelings. Rationalization involves coming up with self-satisfying yet incorrect reasons for one's behavior. And sublimation involves finding socially acceptable ways of discharging energy from unconscious forbidden desires. This is, tends to be viewed as healthy. Um, and <laughs> a classic example would be someone with a desire to smear feces becomes a painter. Um, so this is a desirable thing to translate it into. Um, but getting to this slide in Milan, Theodore Milan said that each personality disorder relies on one primary defense mechanism. So you can see here outlined um, of the different defense mechanisms. They're not all on here, but some of the defense mechanisms mentioned chart onto different personality disorders. Some theorists argue that people with personality disorders use alloplastic defenses, whereby neurotic people use autoplastic defenses. Alloplastic reactions to stress mean you try to change the external environment or blame the external environment. This is like borderline or narcissistic disorder. Autoplastic reactions is blaming oneself, and this is typical of people with depression or anxiety. And you can kind of remember that with alloplastic, where... Um, <clears throat> Allo means other and, cha and changing plastic, so other changing, and autoplastic is yourself, auto being yourself. So as we discussed, recent modifications of psychoanalysis are more collaborative and egalitarian, and they reconceptualize transference and countertransference. With regard to the latter, countertransference, some experts suggest that transference is not a distortion, but instead the patient's response to the therapist's actual behavior in an attempt to imbue that behavior with personal meaning. Similarly, countertransference is viewed not just as a therapist's distorted response to the patient, but when recognized and appropriately managed as a potential source of information about the patient and an important contributor to the curative process. In recent years, a number of psychodynamic therapies have been developed as noted by Prochaska and Norcross, these therapies share several characteristics. In addition to being time-limited, some of them, they target a specific interpersonal problem that's usually identified in the first session, begin using interpretation early in the relationship, and emphasize the development of a strong working alliance. Again, this is for some of them, not all of the new ones. Um, and we're going to actually start by talking again a little more about some of the older ones. But um, just to remember that positive transference is considered more important in some of these new models and negative transference, especially for those with brief psychodynamic therapy because it, get, it makes it a positive relationship and maximizes the client's motivation to work toward their goals. Finally, it reduces the likelihood that progress will be slowed down by the development of a full-scale transference neurosis. So we're going to move into extensions of psychoanalysis and psychodynamics, starting with the older ones first. So those that expanded on, ego, on classical psych, psychoanalysis include ego psychologists, object relations theorists, self-psychologists, and a psychoanalytic social psychologists. Um, that includes Adler and some of those who extended were Adler and Jung. So let's start with ego psychology. This focuses on the ego's capacity for integration and adaptation. Ego psychology represents a transition from the theory of the ego as a helpless rider of the id horse to the ego as a guide as guiding a person's capacity to master life. The major ego psychologists include Heinz Hartmann, Anna Freud, and Eric Erickson. Heinz Hartmann is known as the father of ego psychology. He believed that the ego did not arise out of the id, but in parallel with it, and therefore concluded that people are not only driven by their passions, but also by their thinking. Hartman differentiated between defensive ego functions and ego autonomous functions. He coined the term conflict-free sphere for those ego functions occurring and developing outside of conflict, including the functions of perception, learning, memory, and locomotion. Anna Freud described the ego's capacity for mastery by noting the ego's inherent ability to reconcile drive conflicts with the demands of reality. Anna Freud saw the ego as a medium through which we can get a fuller picture of the id and superego. Along with Melanie Klein, Anna Freud is known for her pioneering work in applying psychoanalysis with children. Unlike Klein, 
Freud did not interpret the play of her child, cli child clients, but rather she interpreted their words. Also, unlike Klein, she attempted to form a strong positive bond with the, the child clients at the outset of treatment, rather than remaining neutral. <clears throat> Eric Erickson combined ego psychology with psychosocial lifespan theory. His theory is based on the premise that development occurs in response to social crises. Erickson believed the ego matures in epigenetic sequences in which development occurs in a series of stages built on mastery of prior stages. Freud had delineated five psychosexual stages, oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. In contrast, Eric Erickson posited eight stages of ego development. The first five correspond in time to Freud's, but Erickson went on to include stages of adult ego development. Whereas Freud interpreted human behavior as a clash between the unconscious id and the conscious ego and superego, Erickson described human behavior as an interaction between the internal, internal world of the psyche, ego id and superego, and the external social world. Erickson's contributions are further described in the lifespan developmental section. So what about object relations theory? Object relations theory deals with the capacity to have mutually satisfying interpersonal relationships. The term object refers to the relationship of the infant to another person. The sort of basis of all of object relations theorists is the belief that the child is object related from birth and there's an inherent drive for satisfying object relationships as fundamental to humans as the need for food. The object relations theorists consider object-seeking relationships with others to be a basic inborn drive. And as they work with people, they emphasize the child's early relationships with objects, especially the child's internalized representations, otherwise known as introjects, of objects, and object relations that become part of the self and influence interactions with other people in the future. The object relations theorists include Melanie Klein, Ronald Fairbairn, Margaret Mahler, and Otto Kernberg. So let's talk briefly about object constancy. Object constancy is a really important premise in object relations theory and maybe even the goal of object relations therapy. Um, and that is to have an experience of the other in an integrated way where you can integrate the good and the bad. It's thought that by about three years of age, age the child has developed a permanent sense of self and object or object constancy and is able to perceive others as separate and related. However, can they integrate the good and the bad? So let's talk about Klein. Okay, so Melanie Klein describes splitting as a major defense mechanism used when the infant has hostile feelings toward a loved object. Out of fear that the hostile feelings could destroy the loved object, the infant splits the loved object into two. For example, the good breast, which is available, soothing, and nourishing, and the bad breast, which is unavailable or withholding. The infant then invests the good breast with all its loving feelings and invests the bad breast with its destructive feelings. Splitting prevents object constancy, recognizing the breast as one object with both good and bad capacities. Melanie Klein, like Freud, worked a great deal with children. Anna Freud. She saw play as the child's free association and conducted child therapy in a manner actually very similar to adult analysis. Winnicott discussed the importance of being a good enough mother, rather than a perfect one. He described pathology as resulting from abandoning one's true self and adopting a false self. In other words, disavowing one's inner feelings and behaving in ways that are acceptable to others. He also highlighted the importance of the transitional object, which serves as a link between developing children and their mothers, like a child's favorite blanket or doll. So when we start talking about Margaret Mahler, we start to get even more into the heart of object relations theory. Um, Mahler focuses on the processes by which an infant assumes his or her own physical and psychological identity. And her model of early development involves several phases and subphases. <clears throat> the initial phase is normal infantile autism, which occurs during the first month of life. During this phase, the infant is self-absorbed and essentially oblivious to, um, to the external environment. This is followed by the normal symbiotic phase in which the child becomes aware of the mother, but is unable to differentiate between me and not me. The actual development of object relations occurs during the separation individuation phase. 
This begins at um, about four to five months of age, and this is composed of four overlapping subphases. Differentiation, practicing, reproachment, and object constancy. During these subphases, the child first takes steps toward separation through sensory exploration of the environment, and then as their loader, mo locomotor skills improve by actual physical exploration. This is followed by a period of conflict between independence and dependence, which is manifested as separation anxiety. By about three years, the child has developed a permanent sense of self and object and is able to perceive others as both separate and relation related. For object relations theorists, maladaptive behavior is thus the result of abnormalities in early childhood development. So remembering that separation individuation is the key process that you want to know about with Margaret Mahler, and it leads to achievement of a separate identity and begins about four months of age. So in psychotherapy, there's um, two different kinds of stances that therapists can take um, or way they can be. One is cultural encapsulation and the other is cultural competence. So cultural com competence, as it sounds, is a good thing. You're aware of your own culture. You've learned about the client's culture and their cultural values. And you've acquire acquired skills and knowledge for working with people um, in, that have different languages, histories, traditions, and values. The culturally encapsulated therapist really impedes effective therapy with minority clients. And this is because the therapist makes narrow assumptions about reality, minimizes cultural variation among individuals, disregards evidence that disconfirms the superiority of the dominant culture, and, and resorts to technique-oriented strategies and short-term solutions, judging others according to the encapsulated therapist self-reference criteria. Overall, minorities are underrepresented in the mental health system. Minorities may not seek mental health services because they understandably distrust the providers and agency, agencies or also understandably view therapy as a potential instrument of oppression. In terms of general medical care, they do not receive the same quality of care that whites do, resulting in higher mortality rates among minorities. There's also a much higher rate of being uninsured among minorities. For example, over 50% of Hispanics are uninsured compared to approximately 25% of whites. This is probably different at this point. This was in 2011, so now under the Affordable Care Act, these statistics are hopefully much improved. Um, so that's a good thing. But even when minorities are insured, they're more likely to rely on emergency room visits for primary care suggesting they have less access to private physicians. So it'd be interesting to see how Amer Affordable Care Act has influenced this.
So lesbian, gay, and bisexual people commonly face social stigmatization, discrimination, and even violence because of their orientation. These experiences put gay men at greater risk for mental health problems and emotional dis distress. Research is still sparse on the effect of these factors on lesbians, and I would imagine even more so for people that are bisexual or identify in some other way. Overall, however, extensive research shows that there are few significant differences between heterosexual people and people who are lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Adolescence poses a unique challenge. Um, LGBT youth are more likely than their heterosexual peers. Well, I should say LGB. Youth are more likely than their heterosexual peers to abuse substances, attempt suicide, and become victims of violence within the family. Those who are rejected by their parents are more likely to become homeless, contract HIV, or become prostitutes. In middle and late adulthood, people in, in same-sex relationships tend to receive less support from their families of origin as compared to heterosexual people. The term heterosexism refers to ideas and actions that denigrate non-heterosexual behavior. Like racism and sexism, it can occur both on a cultural and psychological levels. Although homophobia and heterosexism are used interchangeably, heterosexism is the favored term because homophobia implies fear and hatred when... Um, and it refers to a specific mental state that doesn't actually encompass heterosexism. So what about gay and lesbian identity development? Our art tried and developed a model, and it has four stages, starting with sensitization and um, moving to identity confusion, then identity assumption, and finally commitment. So what about physical and mental health as we talk about diversity issues? Cultural issues and mental disorders. So we need to think about cross-cultural validity of the DSM. We need to think of <clears throat> how cultural, how disorders might vary in a culture um, specific way. And then we need to think about we need to think about that in terms of two things. One, idioms of distress, that the same illness can kind of have a different language, a different way of expression. And we can think of culture-bound syndromes, so something that's actually only found in a particular cultural group. So cross-cultural validity, disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar, panic, and OCD have been found to be pretty prevalent, um, or not prevalent, but universal have been found throughout the world with similar symptoms. Um, Cross-cultural variations of different disorders. Rates might be different, so major depression ranges from 2 to 19 percent depending on the country. An idiom of distress um, is the illness language. So some cultural groups in, uh, express distress more in terms of somatic complaints, witchcraft, and violent behavior. Somatization or the expression of distress through somatic complaints is a very common idiom of distress. Certain physical symptoms are more common among certain cultural groups than others, like stomach symptoms among whites and Latinos, cardiopulmonary symptoms among Asians. Members of some cultural groups more easily admit to somatic complaints and emotional distress, and this preference to present with somatic is viewed by contemporary theories as a sociocultural phenomenon and not a reflection of defensiveness or lack of psychological sophistication. Cultural bound syndromes are only found in one cultural group, and that is like anorexia in the West. So socioeconomic status is also um, an important factor to think about. The socioeconomic status of most minority groups is disproportionately lower um, than that of whites. Lower SES has repeatedly been correlated with higher levels of mental illness and psychological distress. For example, people with lower um, levels of SES are two to three times more likely to have a mental disorder um, than those with highest. It's controversial whether low economic status causes mental illness or mental illness causes low economic status um, or diagnostic procedures are inherently biased. Um, I am pretty sure that you're going to find people of mental illness at any economic status, but I would certainly chalk up the majority of differences in, in socioeconomic status to be um, the cause rather than the 
effect of mental illness for them if we're looking about base, at base rate. Um, diagnostic procedures are inherently biased. Okay, so for example, individuals with identical symptoms were diagnosed as schizophrenic when they were of low SES, whereas they were diagnosed as bipolar when they were higher SES. In psychotherapy, individuals of lower SES and education drop out at a higher rate than those of a higher economic situation and education. So more dropout tend to be assigned to the least experienced. And the important thing is that when they do remain, they derive just as much benefit. Some believe that um, economic status may actually account for differences in treatment outcome that are typically attributed to issues of ethnic diversity. So let's talk a little bit about culture and ethnicity, different communication styles, and then identity development models, and then some on psychotherapy with different groups. So low context and high context communication are important to know. Um, communication styles differ significantly between cultures in terms of personal space, body movement, uh, paralanguage, which is like vocal cues, rate of speech, etc. Low context communication, it's the communication is, ba is based on what is said. So it doesn't matter what the context is. It is very much the words that are said. Middle class white American culture not only tends to use low context, it actually tends to value it. So say what you mean, be direct. High context communication, the situation nonverbal cues significantly affect the meaning of what's verbalized. The same words can have entirely different meaning depending on how and when they're said. For example, a hesitant yes in Filipino culture actually means a polite refusal. African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans generally use a high context communication style. So what is identity development as we move into talking about that? This is the idea that there are stages we all go through as we come to understand who we are. So then what is ethnic identity development? The idea here is that there's a common path toward figuring out who one is um, as a ethnic minority. Um, belief systems evolve in reaction to perceived differential racial group membership. So we'll start with the minority identity development model. This is from Atkinson, Morton, and Sue. Um, and the model starts with conformity, dissonance, resistance, introspection, and finally synergetic articulation and awareness. In the first stage, minority person unequivocally prefers a dominant culture. The person has negative attitudes about oneself, one's minority group, and other minority group. Dissonance. In this stage, the person begins to appreciate aspects of minority culture and question the values and customs of the dominant culture. The stage is marked by conflict between the old depreciating attitudes toward oneself, one's minority group, and other minority groups, and the newer positive attitudes that are developing. 